think we're going to do First Thessalonians 4 today instead of Hebrews 7 like I studied. No, I'm, so uh, we're in for uh, what I hope will be a really instructive time in our study of God's Word this morning. I invite you to take your Bibles together with me and turn to Hebrews chapter 7. Oh yes, for learning lambs if, uh, if you want to head over to the side. So Hebrews chapter 7. Uh, this chapter is uh, really, I've broken it into two pieces, verses 1 to 14 and then 15 to 28, the end of the chapter, uh, because it, it's really making five points and it divides into two primary ideas. Uh, the first is what we're going to be looking at this morning, which is the necessity of a new priesthood. And the second is the superiority of Christ's priesthood. Um, and if you just step back for a minute, and I'll just quickly refresh your memory on the point of Hebrews. It's the mid-60s AD. Israel still exists as a nation. The temple worship system is still intact because the Romans have not come in to squash the rebellion and wipe them out of existence as a nation and destroyed the temple. So all that's still going on. We're about 30, 35 years removed from the crucifixion and the beginning of the church age. There are, there in Jerusalem and Judea in that area, there are a number of Jews who have made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, and some of them were even part of the early church. We saw earlier in, uh, in the book of Hebrews, we saw a reference to the fact that they had uh, heard from eyewitnesses of the ministry of Christ. They had heard from the apostles. We saw in, even in Hebrews 6 that they had seen the miracles and benefited from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, etc. So these are Jewish believers. That's why it's called the epistle to the Hebrews. It's not just to Hebrews, Jewish people, but to Jewish people who have made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. And many of them, because of the persecution of Rome against the church, as well as the, the state of the nation of Israel having, at least apparently, thrown off the Roman yoke, uh, there's an enticement for some Jewish people who made a profession of faith in Christ to turn their back on Christ and go back to the old traditions and to the old sacrificial system, etc., for the first six chapters, your author has been arguing for the superiority of Christ to the Old Testament prophets, to angels, in a major way, to Moses, and then ultimately to Aaron and the Aaronic priesthood. In Hebrews 6, the sternest warning in the book thus far was given, saying, if you have seen all of the evidences of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, if you have come to understand everything that God did in the personal work of Jesus Christ and turn your back on that and you go back to what is now an obsolete sacrificial system, there is, it is impossible for you to repent and be restored into a right relationship with God because you've turned your back on what all of that pointed to. You have thumbed your nose at what all of that pointed to and gone back to it now that it is obsolete and defunct. In chapter 7, he's not talking just about superiority anymore. He's going to talk about, first of all, necessity. Now, it's already kind of been hinted at in Hebrews 5. when, uh, If you remember in Hebrews 5, verses 1 to 10, uh, the, the Aaronic high priesthood is described. He's a priest that is taken from among men and he's appointed on behalf of men and things pertaining to God in order to offer up both gifts and sacrifices for sins. But the thing about the Aaronic priesthood is that he first, because he was a sinner, had to offer up sacrifices on behalf of what? Himself. And then he was able to offer up sacrifices on behalf of the people. In the, in the, in the context of Christ... Uh, we already found out in the early part of the book that he was tempted in all points like we are, yet was what? Without sin. So he never had to offer up sacrifices on behalf of himself. That's what makes him superior to Aaron. Even beyond that, Aaron and all of his descendants keep dying off. Well, Jesus lives forever at the right hand of the Father. 
The sacrifices that Aaron offered continued to be offered time after time after time. And even the Day of Atonement is a day that honors God by offering up sacrifices, admitting sin and guilt, and trusting that God will forgive those sins because we present the offerings that He has, he has demanded, that He has required. But all the while, those offerings are just covering sin. They're not actually taking away sin. That's what Jesus did when He came and presented Himself up as the, the once-for-all sacrifice for sins. His death on the cross did not cover sins, and it did not cancel the debt of sin. It paid for our sins. It washed them away. It washed them away, and they are all covered and gone. And that's the superiority of Christ to the Aaronic priesthood and to the whole of the Old Testament system. In fact, when we get to Hebrews chapter 8, 9, and 10, we're going to get into a lot of details about the difference between animal sacrifices and the once-for-all sacrifice for sins. In the meantime, you'll recall in Hebrews 5 that your author said that unlike Aaron, Christ was appointed not as a descendant of Levi and Aaron, but Christ was appointed as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. That's a cool word to say, isn't it? Melchizedek. We're going to get into that today. Now, he said to his readers, uh, concern, verse 11 of chapter 5, concerning him that is Melchizedek, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain. It's not hard to explain because it's complicated. It's hard to explain because you guys have become dull of hearing. You've become lazy listeners. And that got into that little segue that we did through chapter 6. At the end of chapter 6, where we left off last time, you'll remember that we were told that the hope we have as an anchor of the soul is a hope that is both sure and steadfast. It is one which enters within the veil, that is, into the very presence of God in glory, where Jesus has entered himself as a forerunner for us, that is, one who made way for us to enter in there as well, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Chapter 7, it sits here telling us two things. One, why it was necessary for God to ordain a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek to replace the Aaronic priesthood, the Old Testament priesthood. And secondly, at the end of the chapter, to demonstrate then the superiority of Christ and his priesthood to the Aaronic priesthood. So today, I want to give you uh, three reasons why God needed to provide, or proofs even, that God needed to provide a new priesthood to replace the Aaronic priesthood. Now, some of the argumentation that we're going to get into, like what we've seen a couple of times in the past, might seem a bit like, why is this such a big deal to us? Um, well, and the answer is because we didn't grow up with it. We didn't grow up with the Old Testament sacrificial system. We didn't go up, grow up with all the festivals and with that annual observance of the Day of Atonement and the Passover and Pentecost and uh, the Feast of Booths, etc. We didn't grow up learning the law of Moses and being taught that these sacrifices, these animal sacrifices, are what God has provided for us to admit that we're sinners and to cover over our sins. And, and all of the traditions that go with those historic practices. Just think about your celebration of Christmas or your celebration of Resurrection Sunday or some of you call it Easter your celebration of birthdays, your celebration of Thanksgiving, etc. There are traditions, family traditions that we have, right? Family behaviors. Fam and, and Have you ever noticed that there are regular meals and there are regular desserts and there are regular activities that go with these? Some of these are little fun things and some of these are memorial type things. Well, the whole Old Testament system was established on biblical traditions and prescriptions that God gave, rituals, etc., that became familiar, that became um, 
beloved that became natural to these people to go through these rituals over and over and over again. And you always had a high priest who was coming out and speaking on behalf of God and offering up that sacrifice for his own sins and then offering up the sacrifice for the sins of his people and all the tradition that goes with that. It's hard to change. It's hard to change traditions. It's hard to think of it as Christmas without the lights. It's hard to think of it as Christmas without putting up a tree. It's hard to think of it as Thanksgiving without having turkey. Well, maybe not so much, but anyway, uh, for, for me, for, for some of you, it's a big deal. But if you follow what I'm saying, well, these are people that grew their whole life up with the law of Moses and the sacrificial system in the temple. And Christ came and He fulfilled all of that. All of it. And in those days in particular, it cost something to be a Christian, especially if you were a Jew. If you were a Jew, you not only got persecuted by Rome for being a Christian, you also were ostracized by your own people for identifying with Christ and rejecting them. They ostracized you. That's, the, the, that's John 9. That's why, remember the man born blind? The man born blind, his parents were, were called in by the Sanhedrin to give an account of their son and what happened to him and why. Was he born blind? Yes. Yes, he was definitely born blind. Well, how does he see now? Oh, I don't know. And the Bible even tells us they wouldn't say uh, how he got his sight back because if they said it was by Jesus, which is what happened, then they were afraid they'd throw him out of the synagogue. They'd disassociate from them. Well, the man born blind didn't have any problem with that. He said, Jesus healed me. Okay, you're out. See, listen, that's what happened with the Jew. And what happens in John, excuse me, in Acts 7 and 8? What do they do to Stephen? They put him to death because of his faith in Christ. And then Saul drives most of the Christians out of Jerusalem. There's real animosity there. You lose your whole identification of who you were. You're, in a sense, a foreigner now in your own country and in your own hometown. This is an invitation to walk away from Christ, deny Christ, and go back to everything you used to know. Your author has been building the case all along, not just for the superiority of Christ, but for the necessity of Christ. There is no other way to God. The whole Old Testament sacrificial system was established to point to Christ. And it, was, it gained access to God because it was following the prescription God gave, looking forward to what God was ultimately going to provide in the person and work of Jesus Christ. But it was never sufficient in itself ultimately to take away sins. It just covered them and covered them and covered them. Now, once Christ comes and dies, and you remember we mentioned this, I think, last week. I can't remember if you were in the building when I said this because I go over this a few times. But um, when Jesus died on the cross, it's Matthew who tells us that he says, Te telestai, it is accomplished. And he yielded up his spirit. He died. He, he gave up his life for us. And the veil in the temple that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was ripped by God from top to bottom. And that's about an 80-foot curtain. It's about two inches thick material just ripped. Why would God do that? To demonstrate once and for all the way is now open. The whole sacrificial system is now obsolete because all it ever did was cover until an ultimate offering could be made once for all sins, for all time. The point that your author is making here in Hebrews 7, verses 1 to 14, is that the whole Aaronic priesthood needed to be replaced because while it covered sins for a while, it was never sufficient to take away sins forever. God established the Aaronic priesthood purposefully and deliberately as a testimony to the world. The law of Moses was given 
to Israel to make them as a nation a testimony to the world, instructing the world that all have sinned on an elementary level. And we'll get into this a little bit when we get into the text, but you understand the Ten Commandments. People look at the Ten Commandments as though that's the ultimate standard of God's law. In Galatians 3, the Apostle Paul says it's a tutor. You know what a tutor is? It's when you go to class and you, you need a little help getting it and somebody to help you explain your, you know, I was in the class and I listened, but I didn't quite get it. So I need Leah to come over and, and help me get the rest of the pieces put together like she's doing to a couple of, to our, uh, Liam. Uh, l- listen, th- that's what you need. You need I need a basic uh, fundamental refresher kind of a course. You know, you know what the Mosaic law was, especially the Ten Commandments? You know what that is? That's a tutor. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. I know it's, it, it's, um, it, it's everybody's favorite sermon. At least it's my favorite sermon. But in there, after you get past the Beatitudes, Jesus starts to elaborate on it. And he starts to explain this. He says, you have heard that it's been says, you, said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman with lust in her, for her in his heart has committed adultery with her already where? In his heart. You think the standard is what it says in the Ten Commandments, don't commit the act. What I'm telling you is God's standard is not just don't commit the act, it's don't even have the thought. He does the same thing with the sin of murder. You have heard that it's been told, you shall not commit murder. But I say to you, everybody who is angry with his brother, everybody who says you good for nothing, is guilty before the Supreme Court. What's the Supreme Court that Jesus is talking about? Not the one in Washington. That's the one, the one where you will stand before God ultimately and answer for your sins and be cast into hell. See, the standard of don't commit murder is a, is a, it's a junior high or a grade school kind of expression of the law of God. When Jesus was asked to explain the law, what did he say? What's the greatest commandment? I'll tell you what it is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as you already love what? Yourself. Listen, that's God's standard. You want to know why murder's wrong? Because it's not a love for God. Because the person that you're speaking ill of, having ill feelings or hateful attitude toward, or that you're doing harm to, is created by God in His image. You're doing harm to a fellow image bearer when what God expects you to do is love your brother. Love your neighbor. Listen, why is, ad- why is adultery a sin? Because God designed marriage to be one man, one woman, in a one flesh relationship for life. And that is a violation of that covenant relationship on all levels. You want to know why stealing is wrong? You want to know why coveting is wrong? You want to know why lying is wrong? You want to know why idolatry is wrong? Blasphemy is wrong? It's, to, it's, it's all founded on those two basic principles. That's God's standard. That's always been God's standard. When you look at the Old Testament sacrificial system and the Old Testament Mosaic law, it was established on an elementary level to teach the basics of God's standard and say, listen, God's standard is here, and I've given you enough in this elementary instruction to help you all see that you fall what? Short of it. That's the point of the law. That's the point of the Aaronic priesthood. And the Aaronic priesthood also demonstrates that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And we sin a lot, and there's the need for the shedding of what? A lot of blood. And yet, because of this continual sacrificial system, the continual practice, and the constant death of high priest after high priest after high priest after high priest, and always needing to be replaced, it's very clear that that whole whole system goes on and on and on and on, but it never really deals with the issue. I'm not going to get into this here, but you understand... In a contemporary sense, the whole Roman Catholic system is taking those Old Testament principles and taking the name of Christ and putting them together and creating a whole new traditional system. That's why we have no altar in this church because there is no need for an altar. There are no sacrifices happening in this building. 
The once for all sacrifice for sins happened at the cross. The communion is a memorial. It is not a re-sacrificing of Christ so that when you participate in communion, that forgives you of your sin. You want to know where your sins were paid for? Past, present, and future? Every single one of them? At the cross of Jesus Christ. And yet, people love tradition. People love the practice. People rely upon their part in it. Well, the fact of the matter is, our part in the whole salvation equation is being sinners in need of a Savior. And all God wants us to do is is recognize our sin and repent of our sin and look to Christ and give our lives to Him and dedicate ourselves to living for Him, not because He needs us, but because we need Him. And to live our lives as an expression of appreciation and thanksgiving to Him. Not trying to obey His law or keep those Old Testament uh, precepts and principles. Not reintroducing the dietary laws. Not reintroducing the Sabbath, etc. But making the whole of our life, all day, every day, one great big expression of thanksgiving and praise to God to the best of our ability and to His glory. Listen, that's what the Christian life's all about. And Christ came once and died for our sins to make that possible. And He came as Messiah with the right to rule the throne, not just of David, but the throne of Adam as Messiah, as the Anointed, as the Christ. And He also came and was appointed, remember as Psalm 110 says, He will be, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool beneath your feet, until I subjugate everything beneath you and your authority. For I will appoint you as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. You are not going to be an Aaronic priest, a priest after the order of Aaron, a Levitical priest. You're going to be a whole different kind of priest. That is a priest like the priest king of Salem. Now, Hebrews chapter 7 explains the the priesthood of Melchizedek and relates it to the Levitical priesthood in three ways showing the necessity of replacing the whole Levitical priesthood. He is going to demonstrate in verses 1 to 3 that the Levitical priesthood is inadequate He is going to show in verses 4 to 10 that the Levitical priesthood is inferior. And he is going to show in verses 11 to 14 that the Levitical priesthood is imperfect. And and, uh, uh, just to, to let you know, these are all eyes, so they're easy to remember. The Levitical priesthood needed to be replaced with a priest after the order of Melchizedek because the Levitical priesthood is inadequate, inferior, and imperfect. Now, let me show you this uh, briefly over the next half hour or so as we walk through the text. First of all, the Levitical priesthood is inadequate, and so it needs to be replaced. Well, what is it that makes it inadequate? It's not perpetual. It doesn't go on forever. Notice in verses 1 and 2, for this Melchizedek, and again, he's returning to the subject of Melchizedek now, This Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth of all the spoils, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which means king of peace. Now, uh, I'll give you a little bit of a Hebrew lesson here really quick. You say, well, where does the idea of of king of righteousness come from? Melchizedek is a compound name made up of two Hebrew words. Melech, or Melchi, is the term king in Hebrew. Tzedek uh, is the Hebrew word for righteousness. So that's where you get from his name the idea of king of righteousness. And that's why your author says... uh, 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 the translation of his name is King of Righteousness. And then King of Salem, which is King of Peace. Salem comes from the Hebrew word. Can you guess it? What's the Hebrew word for peace? Shalom. Uh, Salem. 
Even, even Solomon's name, Salomo, is, is from that word shalom. And so he is king of a city whose name essentially means peace. Now, I, am, I, I do not believe it is an incidental that you go back to the Old Testament patriarchal period when Abraham lived, long before uh, Isaac, long before Jacob, long before Moses. In the days of Abraham, there was a man who was named Melchizedek. And his name literally meant king of righteousness. And he happened to be king of Salem, which is a city by the name of Peace. Now you say, well, what is Salem? Well, there are, there are two possible locations for this. One is in Shechem. And a few uh, historical writers and commentaries have understood it to be that. Uh, to, to, to actually be Salim, which is the same word. Most, and I would agree with this, together with Josephus, the historian, and this is likewise confirmed by Psalm 76, verse 2, which associates Salem with Mount Zion, which is Jerusalem. And so he was king of Salem, and it doesn't matter whether it's Jerusalem or not, but that's probably it. He was the king of Jerusalem, which was typically just called Salem in those days, king of the city by the name of Peace. And his name was King of Righteousness. That was his proper name. And he was, notice it says in the beginning of verse 1, priest of the Most High God. Now this is interesting because that's an expression used consistently in the Old Testament to refer to the one true God, the God of Israel. But remember, this is before Israel existed. This is before Moses, before Joseph, before Jacob, this, this even before Isaac is conceived. This is in the days of Abraham, the, the chief patriarch. And the fact that Melchizedek was the king of the city of Salem and also was recognized as the priest of the Most High God, what's that tell you? Abraham was not the only believer in the planet in that day, right? In fact, Job lived in this patriarchal period, and we learn in Job 1 and 2 that God looked at him and said he was the most righteous man on the planet. Melchizedek is one that God personally appointed to be his priest, and this is completely outside of the Mosaic law. This is completely outside of the whole Old Testament prescription. God ordained him to be his priest. And his name was King of Righteousness, and he served in the city whose name was, pre, uh, was Peace. That's the guy. And he's a real guy. He's an actual historical figure. A literal person. And Abraham met him. This is a reference to Genesis 14. We'll go there in a minute. Abraham met him as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings. So this is the historical context where Lot's living in Sodom and the kings come in and it's all due to tribute and all this other stuff. So they, these, these foreign kings come in and they, they run, overrun Sodom and they take all these people prisoner and they take all the loot and the booty and they hit some other cities and then they're leaving. And when Abraham hears that Lot, his nephew, has been kidnapped like this, he puts together his guys and goes after them. Well, he, he has an excellent plan, assaults them, and wins. And after winning and taking all the spoils, he encounters a man by the name of Melchizedek, who happened to be king of Salem and also the priest of the Most High God. And when Abraham, the chief patriarch, encounters him, this is his experience. Abraham apportioned a tenth, and by the way, that word tenth of the spoils literally means the top of the heap. It's a term that's typically translated tithe. Uh, that's the idea. He gave him the, the tenth part, but the, the choicest part, and he gave it to Melchizedek. Why? Because he was recognized by Abraham as the priest of the Most High God. 
That shows you the superiority of Melchizedek to whom? To Abraham. And then, by the way, Melchizedek also blesses Abraham. And we'll talk about that uh, when we get to the next section. So there's a pretty clear indication right here that this Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God, the God of Israel, before Israel exists as a nation, actually before Israel exists as a heritage apart from Abraham. And Abraham recognized him as a priest of the Most High God and gave him a tithe and was blessed by him. So Melchizedek is clearly superior even to the chief patriarch. And what's uniquely identified about him, according to Scripture here in verse 3 of Hebrews 7, and this is where you need to put on your seatbelt and pay attention with me for a minute, because this, if, if you grew up a Jew, things like genealogies would be things that were, you were regularly accustomed to. When you just read this in English with only a Western mindset, this doesn't really make a lot of sense. This is where some of the errant views come from. It says in verse 3, Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest how long? Perpetually, meaning forever, having no end. You say, oh, so this guy lived forever. No, he was not in fact, some writers, historically, even a, a couple of church fathers, have said this guy must have been either an angel or a theophany or a Christophany. You know what a theophany is? It's those times when God actually personally showed up. The pre-incarnate Christ shows up. And He's going to show up in Genesis 18 and 19 and literally speak with, with Abraham. And you know it's God that shows up because He receives worship. Um, this is not a Christophany, and this is not a guy that lived forever. This is not a guy that had no parentage. This is an actual, literal, historical figure, and I'll show you that when we go to the text. But when it says, without father, without mother, meaning primarily without any father being identified, without any mother being identified, and without being tied personally to any genealogy. Well, if you are one who reads through your Bible every year, or a couple of times a year, have you noticed what Genesis is characterized by? A whole bunch of what? Genealogies, a string of names. Have you ever noticed that at the end of every one, at the beginning and the end of every one of those strings of names, you, you, you probably just read through them and go, oh yeah, what a chore. Some of these names are hard to pronounce. God, does it still count for reading if I just skim over the names, right? You ever done that? Okay. Well, the significance of the list of names shows heritage and shows the tie. Well, in Genesis 11, you have the heritage of Abram before the Abrahamic covenant is made. And it, and it shows which son of Noah he's tied to. You know what is never given to us in Scripture? Any reference to the mother or the father of Melchizedek. There's no genealogy for him at all. Have you read Genesis 5? Isn't that one of the most interesting chapters in the Bible? So-and-so lived so many days. He had a son. He lived so many days after that, and he died. And his son lived so many days, and then he had a son, he lived so many days after that, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. I hope your name isn't Andy, okay? Because that's what the chapter is about. Everybody dies. They have their son, and then they die. So they carry on the heritage, but they keep dying off. It's called the graveyard chapter in the Bible. Well, you know what? There is no tie of Melchizedek to any genealogy. Doesn't mean he didn't have one. Doesn't mean he didn't have heritage. But he was identified by God as a priest with no regard for what his genealogy was. And that's the point. Jesus is not a descendant of Levi and Aaron. Like Melchizedek, he has no genealogy that gives him a claim to the priesthood. He's just ordained by God in a special way uniquely because God has chosen to put him in that position. 
And just like there is no record of an end of Melchizedek's ministry or life, so too Christ himself will have truly no end to his ministry. It is a perpetual ministry. And notice it doesn't say without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made the Son of God. No, made what? What's the next word? Like. This is a comparison. This is not identifying this as a theophany or Christophany. This is not the Son of God. Melchizedek, when he was there and Abraham came to him, Melchizedek did not receive worship. He received a tenth. Melchizedek identified God as the source of Abram's victory and then blessed Abraham. And he also blessed God. He acted as a priest, not as God. And that's the first thing that demonstrates uh, the, the inadequacy of the Levitical priesthood. It is not a perpetual priesthood. What we need is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Somebody that can serve in that role, not because he has some kind of an, a, a her, an heritage that gets him a, a, a right to claim it, but somebody that God appoints that can go on in, in that priestly service forever. And that's exactly what we have in the personal work of Jesus Christ. The Levitical priesthood is an inadequate priesthood because it is not perpetual. Secondly, it is an inferior priesthood. This is verses 4 to 10. It is a, uh, an inferior priesthood. And this is demonstrated by the fact that we've, in a sense, the point we've already made, and that is that Abraham, the chief patriarch, and the chief claim to fame and identification with God that Israel had as a nation. You remember the ministry of John the Baptist? Remember what he said? Do not say that I have Abraham as my father, because I say to you that God can raise up from these stones sons of Abraham. Just being a son of Abraham does not make you right with God. The Messiah is coming. The Lord is coming. And in order to be ready for His coming, you need to repent and be baptized, demonstrating that you recognize yourself as a sinner in need of a Savior to truly be ready for the Lord when He gets here. Just being able to identify yourself with Abraham does not make you one of God's people. Now, that shows us not only the need for repentance and for a provision of salvation that goes beyond the whole Old Testament sacrificial system, that also shows you the high view Jewish people have of Abraham himself and how they are, their claim to identification with Abraham as his descendants was a foundational part of their heritage and their traditions and their beliefs. That's why your author is going to go through here and show that Abraham is inferior to Melchizedek. And that's demonstrated by what happened. Notice in verse 4. Now observe how great this man, that is Melchizedek, was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. Now, keep your finger here in Hebrews 7 and jump back to Genesis 4 with me, or 14 with me. Genesis chapter 14, we're going to skip down a bit through the beginning of the chapter. The opening of the chapter just describes the context of those five kings who get together and how they invade and how they conquer Sodom and some other places and how they take captives and spoil and, and then they're making their way back home. Well, in verse 13, we're told that a fugitive, somebody that, that, that escaped the carnage, came and told Abram the Hebrew... He was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, uh, brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner, and these were allies with Abram. And when Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he led out his trained men born in his house, 318 strong. And he went in pursuit of those invaders as far as Dan, is that northern territory. 
and he divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants, uh, and uh, he and his servants, and he defeated them, and he pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus, and he won. And he brought back all the goods. So he, he rescued from those armies in the victory all of the spoils from Sodom and those other cities. And all the goods. And he also brought back his relative Lot along with Lot's possessions. And also the women and the people. So he's pulled off this huge heroic victory. Then after his return from the defeat of Kedolaomer, which is the name of the king, and the kings who were with him. The king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, uh, that is the, the valley of the kings. Uh, and uh, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was priest of the Most High God. And just so we're clear here, he brought out bread and wine in a sense of celebration and fellowship. This is not the first exercise of communion, despite what a commentator or two might tell you. This is, this is sitting down for fellowship, to recognize and celebrate your victory and your rescue of your, of your nephew. And notice, Melchizedek blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, or Abram of God Most High. You say, well, why does it say Abram instead of Abraham? Because God is going to later name Abram, Abraham. Abram means father of people, father of many. Abraham means father of multitudes. And uh, God's going to rename him even before he has any, any real children. So anyway, so uh, blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand and given him a tenth of all. Excuse me, uh, given the, your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tenth of all. Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek. Why? Because he was the priest of the Most High God. And as a worshiper of God, which Melchizedek identified Abram as, he gave a, a tithe to the representative of God as an acknowledgement to God that, yes, I accomplished this by your strength. In fact, if you are familiar with the word bless in Hebrew, uh, the term bless when it is referred uh, to people or to God, it has a slightly different meaning. When you bless God, you are acknowledging Him as the source of your enabling power, the source of your success, the one in it that empowered you to be able to be victor victorious or accomplish whatever you accomplished. That's what it means to bless God. When God blesses you, it means He empowers you. He shows favor toward you and enables you to accomplish something. And that's exactly what Melchizedek says. Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. You have been favored by God and are identified by God as one of His and have been empowered by Him to accomplish His purposes. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. The reason you were successful is because God enabled you. And this is Melchizedek speaking to Abram, the chief patriarch. And this is Genesis 14. This is after Genesis 12 and God makes the initial contract. The initial statement of the Abrahamic covenant is made in Genesis 12. Abraham is already, already the recipient of the Abrahamic covenant. And yet he still tithes to Melchizedek, this priest with with, with no heritage that's recorded, no additional reference. He does not occur again in the Old Testament except in Psalm 110 when the Messiah is promised to be not only King of kings and Lord of lords, but also a priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is the, this is the superiority of Melchizedek even to Abram, much less to his descendants. Now if you go back to Hebrews chapter 7, Look at verses 4 and 5 with me again. Now observe how great this man, namely Melchizedek, was to whom Abram the patriarch gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who receives the priest office have commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brothers, 
even though these are descended from Abraham. In other words, in the Levitical system, you remember the Levites did not get an inheritance in the land. What was their inheritance? God. And so as a result, they were apportioned a few cities throughout the land, scattered throughout the land of Israel, but they did not get a tribal inheritance. Their inheritance was God and the, and the worship system, the service to God, the ministry. All of the tribes were instructed to give a tenth to the Levites. And that's of the choicest portions. That was what they gave to God. And God gave that to the Levites as their uh, proper distribution and their support. Beyond this, the high priesthood got the choicest of that, the tenth uh, portion of that. And that was their inheritance and their support from God. And that's what the, Levi, uh, the Levitical priesthood does. The sons of Levi who receive the priest's office have a commandment from God in the law, the law of Moses, to collect a tenth from the people. And that is from their own brothers, and they're all equal, right? But God has elevated one above, even though they're all descended from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham and bless the one who had the promises. Abraham already had the Abrahamic covenant promise. And yet, he, Melchizedek blesses him. Abraham already had been identified by God as his man. And yet, he gave a tithe to Melchizedek. Shows the superiority of Melchizedek to Abraham. Verses 7 and 8. Without any dispute... The lesser is blessed by the greater, and in this case, mortal men receive tithes. In that case, one receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. In other words, uh, in the Levitical system, this is a perpetual provision for Levites who keep dying off and the families who keep dying off. It's part of the mortality of the human race. But in the case of Melchizedek, this is a one-off circumstance. There's no record of his day. He just serves as an illustration that God had a priest in Abraham's day that was a priest of the Most High God, and Abraham recognized him as his superior. Verse 9, And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now, this might not make any sense to you, but this is the picture. The Jews all drew their identification as God's people from being descendants of Abraham, who got the promise. I will bless your seed. In fact, uh, you don't need to turn there. Let me just read it for you. The promise that God made in Genesis 12. The Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's the initial articulation of the covenant. When you get to the elaboration of it, you will see he says, uh, uh, in uh, Genesis 17, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you and I will multiply you exceedingly. I will multiply you exceedingly. I will make you n numerous in m multitudes. That's why he renames him Abraham. He promises that, that through his seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. His descendants will be as numerous as the stars. That's what makes you, I, I am identifying you and your heritage as my people. And, they're all, and that's because they're in Abraham. Okay, but while they're still in Abraham, long before they're born, their greatest patriarch, their greatest source of identification with God and, and claim to be identified as God's people recognize Melchizedek as superior to him. See, the, the, in a sense, since Levi 
was still in his greatest grandfather's loins, <laughs> he gave an offering to Melchizedek. It, Melchizedek is a different priesthood, and it's a better priesthood because it's a perpetual priesthood and because it's a unique priesthood not tied to the uh, inferior Levitical system. And, and ultimately, the Levitical priesthood is an imperfect priesthood. And this is in verses 11 to 14. Notice he says, Now if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, the people received the law, that is the Mosaic law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not to be designated according to the order of Aaron? If the Aaronic priesthood and the whole Levitical system was able to accomplish salvation, then why is it that Psalm 110 says, and you can turn there with me if you want, Psalm 110. This is a psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion. You will, you will rule from Zion. That is a reference to Jerusalem. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power and holy array from the womb of the dawn, from the beginning of the day. Your youth uh, are uh, to you as the dew. And the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Why would God make a promise like this if the Levitical priesthood was able to accomplish perfection and salvation? Listen, the Aaronic priesthood is inadequate because it's not perpetual. The Levitical priesthood is inferior, and that's able to be demonstrated because Abraham himself acknowledged the superior in giving uh, and recognizing Melchizedek as a priest of the Most High God. And even beyond this, the Levitical priesthood is imperfect because if that could have accomplished perfection, salvation, God would never have needed to promise something to replace it. The people received the Levitical priesthood and the instruction for it in the Mosaic Law. Have you noticed in the early chapters of the book of Acts, especially when you get into chapters 10 and 11, have you noticed something about the Mosaic Law that gets demonstrated really clearly and that even the apostles have trouble uh, and the early church has trouble working through? Peter gets invited to go to Cornelius' house. Do you know who Cornelius was? It was a Gentile, right? He's a Gentile. <laughs> and Peter's like, oh, I can't go there. He's a Gentile. I can't go into his house. He's a Gentile. <laughs> and God gives him a vision of a sheet that comes down and it has all of the unclean things that were described in the Old Testament as you're not allowed to eat these, right? These are all forbidden because God has declared them all unclean and you have nothing to do with any of those because I want you to be an objective illustration, a, a literal demonstration by the way you live your life, by the things you will do and the things you won't do, that you're living set apart unto me. And there's all these animals that you're not allowed to eat. Why do you think they're not allowed to eat them? Oh, because it's just wrong to eat pork. Bacon is bad. Right? Well, do you know in Genesis 9, bacon was fine? You realize that? Genesis 9, go, kill, eat. Whatever you want. Beef uh, and pork, it's on the menu. Why is it off the menu for Israel? As a unique demonstration for them to be truly set apart in a very demonstrative uh, and clear way, distinct from the, other tri from the other peoples that were living there in Canaan and, and living in that area. You're going to be, hey, all of these are the stipulations now. The, the whole Sabbath law, that's the sign of the Mosaic Covenant. God doesn't want you to worship Him one day a week. God wants you to worship Him all day, every day, by the way you live your life. Yes, you should still, on a regular basis... And I think it's a good pattern to follow that weekly basis. Uh, it, it is right to get together as God's people and worship Him corporately. 
In fact, your author is going to get to the place where he says, don't forsake the assembling together of yourselves as some are want to do. But it's not because it's a Sabbath regulation. All of those specific regulations were for the nation of Israel and part of the law of Moses as an objective demonstration of a testimony to all nations of sin and what living separate uh, unto God looks like. And the whole Levitical system was meant to teach that apart from the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But none of those animals ever, ever resulted in forgiveness. They were all, those who offered those sacrifices were forgiven on the basis of faith in the ultimate provision God would make. See, this is why we're in such a superior position to the Old Testament saints. This is why the Old Testament law is obsolete. It's not wrong. It's been taken care of in total in the personal work of Jesus Christ. God does not expect less of us than he expected of Old Testament saints. He expects more. And he expects us to live freely for him as an expression of worship and praise without the need for elementary do this and don't do that. If perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the the law, the Mosaic law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? Do you think that God could have uh, orchestrated in such a way that Jesus would have had a legitimate claim both to being a descendant of Judah as well as being a descendant of, of Levi and even of Aaron? Well, sure he could. And he didn't. Purposely. Why? Because Jesus is not a replacement of Aaron uh, along the same order. He is a complete replacement of the whole priesthood. The whole Levitical system is obsolete because there's no need for the continuation of offerings. There's no need for the whole system. What Jesus did, He did once for all to pay for our sins. Now, again, for you today, that may not be a big deal. But for the Jews at the time that this letter is written, this is, this is the big deal. Do not go back to the temple sacrificial system. It's obsolete. You go back to that and you are thumbing your nose at God, rejecting what He has provided as a once-for-all sacrifice for sins and running back to what pictured it. Verse 12, for when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of what also? Law. This is why the Mosaic law is now obsolete. It doesn't mean it's okay to murder. It doesn't mean it's okay to commit adultery. It doesn't doesn't mean it's okay to covet or lie or steal. What it means is that whole sacrificial system and the application of the Mosaic law has been fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. For us, to live is, in fact, what was it that Simon said? For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That's it. That's that's, That's the only instruction that we need now. Live for Christ. Verse 13. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no one has officiated the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. You want to know who Jesus is? Jesus is not a priest that is the next in the line of the Aaronic priesthood who has a rightful claim to that ministry as well, who now can stand up and and lead in, in presenting these offerings all the time. No, 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 no. He's way better than that. He is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is going to be elaborated on in the rest of the chapter and demonstrate. You you know what's so cool about Jesus being a priest after the order of Melchizedek? (laughs) He's not taking over oversight of a sacrificial system that goes on and on and on and on. He went and offered himself up once as the ultimate sacrifice that took away all of our sins. And his ministry to us is that, as it says at the end of chapter 6, he is the anchor of the soul that is within the veil. He is our forerunner. He died 
and offered himself up for us so that he once and for all paid for all of our sins, all of the sins of Moses and David and Isaiah and Abraham and all of the Old Testament saints, all of the sins of Peter and James and John and Paul and all of those first century saints and all of the sins of Calvin and all the way up through us and until he returns. He paid in his death and that one offering up of himself, he paid for all of our sins, period. All done. And now he is seated at the right hand of the Father. You want to know why it's so significant that the Bible says he is seated at the right hand of the Father? What did the high priest do? Remember the Day of the Atonement? We talked about this many times. The high priest goes through all the ritual and he presents that offering for himself and then he goes into the holy place and into the holy of holies and he does his little deal and then what? Sits down and says, so God, how's things going? No, 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 no. They have bells on his robe and a rope around his ankle so in case he does something wrong, they can drag his dead body out. He goes in there, does his job, turns around and hightails it out of there. And then he goes right back down and goes through the same process for the people and goes in behind the veil, makes his sacrifice for the people and he hightails it out of there again. Jesus went inside the veil and sat down. Why? The work's done. He's a forerunner. He made, a, made it possible now for us to get in there. Listen, this is, this is why we need not a replacement for the Levitical priesthood and a replacement for Aaron. <laughs> we need a priest after the order of Melchizedek and that's exactly what God has promised to us in the person of Jesus Christ and that's exactly what God has given to us in the person of Jesus Christ. This is, this is why we need a new priesthood and why God gave us a new priesthood. This is why going back to the Old Testament sacrificial system is such an offense to God. It's, listen, it's not just wrong. It's, it's trampling underfoot the blood of the Son of God. It's thumbing your nose at God and saying, I don't want what you gave, I'm going back to this. God prescribed this, and, it's, and, and I'm going to stick with the old way. Listen, it, it, it's not okay to go back to the old way because all the old way did was provide a covering until what God ultimately promised came. You go back to the old way now, it's not less acceptable to God than the fulfillment. It is a great offense to God because you have rejected His one and only Son. This is, this is why in Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, the warning says that those who go back crucify again to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. They're rejecting the ones for all sacrifice for sins and so there is no hope for you. Christ is superior to the entire Levitical system because He is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And that is why going back is such a great offense to God. You go back to the shadow and you are outright rejecting the reality. You're rejecting Christ and you're replacing His work with your own work because the sacrificial system up to the cross was pointing to the cross in faith. Now that He has come, going back is a rejection of Him and what He did and it replaces it with something that not only doesn't facilitate atonement even temporarily, but something that greatly offends God and makes a mockery of the work of His Son. I hope that the one thing that has been accomplished in our looking at this text today is that you have seen just how great our Savior is and how glorious our position as Christians is, especially in a New Testament context. We don't, we don't go through all this exercise and all this shedding of blood over and over and over again, trusting that someday God will provide forgiveness. We have seen his provision. And we know that he has been good to his word. And we know, you know, for the Old Testament saints, 
Death was a weight. This is why Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise or in Abraham's bosom. Old Testament saints did not have immediate access to God until Christ came and once for all satisfied uh, the, the penalty for our sins. Ephesians says that when Christ died, he took captivity captive and he took them all right up to glory. What's the New Testament say for us as New Testament believers? To die for, uh, wait, uh, absence from the body is presence with the Lord. Why is it that when we die, we go straight to the presence of God, where Abraham and Moses and the rest didn't? I'll tell you why. Because Christ has paid our sins. It's done. There's no greater hope than that. There's no need to fear death because I'm in Christ. There's no need for rules and regulations because my life is characterized by a desire to live for Christ. And that's it. I don't fear divine discipline. When I do wrong, I want to repent. And I want to repent not because I'm afraid I'm going to lose my salvation and not because I'm afraid He's going to discipline me or take away privilege. Do you want to know why I repent and try really hard to put on righteousness in His place? Because I am so thankful for the love He's shown to me in Christ. And that is what it means to be a New Testament believer. Father, thank You so much for this day and for Your Word and for Your kindnesses to us that are evident in abundance in Christ. Grant that we, by the power of your Spirit, might be enabled to live for you until you return for us or call us home. In Christ's name, amen.